Greetings from Castle Gory, from Mickey, Aurora, and from me. We wish to make a point. Today, we are promoting racial inclusivity. Well, my girls promote racial inclusivity at all times because, of course, they're black, white, and tan. Well, yours truly is promoting racial inclusivity, wearing a Moretto Veneziano, which, contrary to what ignoramuses would think, is actually a sign of several hundred years old of racial inclusivity. I think we need to promote racial inclusivity, especially as how the subject I will be covering today is laden with racism, racist abuse, and racist misinterpretation, which is most unfortunate. And I know from my thousands of people of color who have written in with wonderful comments over the years that they also deplore the use of the race card in an unacceptable way. And it has to be said, the book Endgame is sleazy, unsavory. It's like wading through a sea of feces. Amit Scabies has no understanding of what a heritage is, which is surprising because his father is a Scot and his mother is Iranian. And of course, the Persian civilization is one of the oldest in the world. So he should have a feeling for heritage. He clearly has none. But then again, I suppose anybody who despises himself as much as he does, because if you look at pictures of him a few years ago and look at pictures of him now, it's like chalk and cheese. The book is so nasty. It is so gratuitously nasty. I mean, you can write or read a negative work. For instance, Tom Bauer's Revenge is relentlessly anti-Megan. But it's not gratuitously nasty. Scabies, and never was anybody more appropriately named than he has been, because he is nothing but a massive itch and rarely a disease of the flesh that is so annoying and off-putting that it is truly unbelievable. He has gone out of his way to trash everybody, but I actually suspect a part of it is, like Megan, he's out of his depth. Like Megan, he has a chip on his shoulder. His chip on his shoulder seems to be that notwithstanding the fact that he's wholly white, unless he is one of those Iranians who is mixed race, but purebred Iranians are purely Aryan, hence the use of the word. And let's remember, Iran abuts the Caucasus, which is where the description of white people comes from, Caucasian. Maybe he's got a chip on his shoulder because he, he was a dark-skinned Caucasian and wanted to be a fair-skinned Caucasian. So he and Megzi Baby might actually have something in common. They might actually despise themselves because of their 
origins. I throw that out for what it's worth, because both of them are constructs in artificiality and uh, surgical enhancement and uh, cosmetic enhancement. Now, I have nothing against people who decide they want a little bit help of help here and there. I have friends who've had nose jobs. No big deal. But when you end up being as plastic as those two are, and you have changed your configuration to be polite about it to the extent that they have, you do have to question what's going on psychologically. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing that's going on with him, actually, is he has no concept of or feeling for heritage and how people who have something to hand on are custodians and they can only change things carefully. I mean, since he's half Iranian, he should understand that trying to change too much too quickly will result in the downfall of one of the greatest civilizations known to humanity and that had had a monarchy for 3,500 years and now has been replaced by a rampant theocracy that is little better than pseudo-civilized. He's clearly not learned that lesson either. He doesn't have a feeling for the fact that you are a steward and that you are careful as you nurture your heritage to hand it on in as intact and as enhancing a way as possible. I just make that point for what it's worth, and I make another point for what it's worth. He's a bitchy little queen. That's what he is. And if he doesn't like it, he can sue me. Because he is a bitchy little queen. I have nothing against gays, and I certainly have nothing against people who are justifiably reposting when it is necessary. But to be as gratuitously nasty as he is, is truly awful, truly awful. And now I will plunge in with Anne, because we are going to be addressing the one thing that isn't in any of the English speaking versions of the book, but they managed to manipulate and deviously insert into the Dutch version of the book. And I have a comment from a Dutch reader who, Anne, Dear Lady C, I read the Dutch version and Dutch speaking and the English version of the part of the book where Scabies talks about the royal racist. In the English version, the two sentences are, quotes, but in the pages of these private letters, remember, these are letters that Meghan wrote to Charles and Charles wrote in response to Meghan. Private letters. Do we have a recollection of her suing because she alleged that the contents of a private letter she wrote, which she had leaked to People magazine, had ended up once her father tried to preserve his reputation against her marauding uh, in the Mail on Sunday. But anyway, in the pages of these private letters, two identities were revealed. Laws in the United Kingdom prevent me from repeating who they were. In the Dutch version, it says, but in the private letters, one name was revealed and confirmed, 
Charles. <laughs> now Scabies is trying to claim that this was a translation error. As you see, this is not possible because of how the two are completely different in structure. This was a deliberate move from Scabies to try and go around British law. What do you think? Anne, I love you. Thank you so much for this. Of course, they pulled the book. So even those of us who would be able to try to get somebody who was Dutch speaking to translate wouldn't know well we'd be thwarted now but thank god for you it is a deliberate move it's clearly a deliberate move and i'm going to tell you as someone who has written well over i don't remember how many books i've written well over 10 12 13 i don't remember there's a process the author writes the book hands it over to the publisher who involves an editor. The book is handed back to the author for the author to approve any changes that are made and to add further embellishments. It's handed back to the editor who has another look at it. If there are any further changes or additions, it's handed back to the author who ticks it off. It is then handed over before it goes to the printers. It is handed over to the lawyers, if it is at all contentious, for it to be what is called in the trade legal, which means it is read for libel and for defamation. Pretty much the same thing, actually. I'm just dotting my I's and crossing my T's. After that, it is then handed on to the printers. Once the printers have typeset it, it is handed back to the publisher and the author who pr who the printer proofread get sorry the publisher proofreads it or gets a proofreader more accurately to proofread it that's the publisher's province it is then handed over to the author who checks the proofs that have been proofread and for any changes that the author herself or himself or depending on somebody who's not human itself might come up with and it is then handed back to the publisher who hands it to the printer who prints the book and then it is handed over to the publisher and who gives copies to the author. If it is a translation, the process is adhered to, to the point at which the book is set in a foreign language. The book is identical insofar as it is possible to be identical. The translator will obviously have to change certain, say, similes, because each language has its own nuances. And, you know, a simile in one language doesn't necessarily translate into another. But the content of the book is identical. 
And certainly, there is no way that, and I'm here to tell you, as a very experienced writer, there is no way that that book had a mistake made in translation. The translator had the same content that the English speaking version had, because that's what is ticked off by the lawyers. And then it is translated. The only way that a change of that enormity could have been made was if it was made deliberately by somebody involved in the production process. And the only person who it would suit to have something like this happen in terms of from the publishing side of it is amid scales. It also could suit Megan. Now, there is talk that Megan A could have orchestrated all of this, or B that Amit Scabies could have, knowing who Megan asserted the supposed racist was, would have actually told him and he decided to run with it on his own because if she's starting to freeze him out, he could realize, oh, this is my last chance. I'm going to go with this. That is not as likely a scenario as Megan deciding that, well, but Megan obviously had to have told him. Otherwise, he wouldn't know. Now, let me just before getting into the book itself, make the point. This has been made to me by a royal. The idea that the king was racist is rubbish. He walked her down the aisle. He volunteered to walk her down the aisle when there was all that trouble with her father. He volunteered. She's the one who refused to have him walk her down the aisle the whole way. That's number one. Number two, he wasn't going to be particularly concerned about the colour of the baby because some of his cousins have black blood. That's right. In fact, several of his cousins have black blood. And another issue is he wasn't would have not have been concerned about the baby being too dark because the darker the baby was going to be was the better it was for the royal family. Remember, nobody particularly wanted this marriage between Meghan and Harry. The only thing that allowed the marriage to proceed was the fact that she was a woman of colour. Otherwise, they would not have allowed the marriage. So let's put all of that in its proper context. I think it's also important to remind you of one or two salient points. First of all, the Dutch version of the book makes it clear there was only one putative racist. The English version of the book alleges there were 
two putative racists. Well, not both can't be the truth, but let's cast our minds back to the Oprah interview. Harry claimed that a comment was made before his marriage to Meghan. Meghan claimed a series of comments and conversations took place that Harry told her about while she was magnant with Archie. Yeah. Again, clear contradictions. These people can't even get their stories straight. And I have to tell you, when it's something that is as important as these artificial claims that they have made about Archie and the King. And let's remember, the King isn't the only person, because I mentioned previously, when all of this arose at first, I was told that they had Princess Anne in their sights, and she had said no such thing. And it's really telling and interesting that they don't mention the second supposed, the second putative racist at all in the Dutch version but we are being led to believe in the English speaking version that this second putative racist was not actually, the identity wasn't spelt out, but it was hinted at. Then you have Scabies saying that Princess Anne was the one who precipitated Frogmore, that Princess Anne is the one who set that ball a rolling. And now we're hearing that, in fact, the second person in the frame is supposed to be Catherine, except as Anne's translation shows, in the Dutch version, there's only one putative racist named. So, yet again, anything to do with Meghan and her chief propagandist, Josef Goebbels Scabies, uh, becomes a mystery compounded by a drama exaggerated by speculation, covered in opacity. The whole thing, and what mischief making, but you know, there's nothing new in the book. It's all a rehash of the lies and the vomit that has been expectorated by Meghan, Harry, and their Goebbels, Mr. Amid Scabies. I'm going to read two more. The Bardo Flynn Denhill. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, Theo Bardo. <laughs> Theo, Theo Bardo. Flynn Denhill says, <laughs> sorry, it's really difficult sometimes. Dear Lady C, the Les Majesté law was abolished in the Netherlands in 2020. Do you think it is a coincidence this country was chosen to accidentally reveal Megzi baby's truth? And the words accidentally and truth are in inverted commas. No. 
I don't think it was accidentally, let's remove the quotes. I think it was calculatedly and deliberately done because they knew it would get out and they made sure it got out. What I suspect has happened is because it would be an expensive mistake for the foreign rights publisher to have made. I suspect the copy was swapped before it was handed over for translation into Dutch. And therefore, my suggestion as somebody who has been in the publishing industry for decades is that the publisher actually looks very carefully and sues the clutch box off those jerks. Why should the publisher have to suffer the loss? Because the publisher would have handed, would have had a translator who worked from the manuscript, the legal manuscript. This is not accidental. But you know, it's interesting. Scabies and Megan are such liars. They're so intrinsically dishonest. They are caught out in lies left, right and center. And they both seem to think that everybody is such a fool that just because they are creatures of plastic and artificiality that we're all going to believe that they're real. Look at me, look at me. I'm really real. I'm authentic. I'm not at all plastic. I simply look it and act it and truly am. Pat Young at Heart says, Lady C, I would value your thoughts on whether the name of the racist was purposely added to Endgame for release in the Netherlands so it could be blamed on translation. I am of the opinion it was, but am I right? Thank you and love to you and the fur babies. I've covered that. You're right. And before I get on to the rest of this, let me do Instagram loving B wife says, Lady C, fabulous news. Scooby Dooby has just knifed himself in the back <laughs> with his own vanity and stupidity. He has hoisted himself by his own petard, so to speak. In a new interview with, I believe, The Telegraph, he has admitted lying about his age, saying he had deducted a few years, I make it seven, from his age as he was insecure about turning 40 and didn't think anyone would find out. So he freely admits to being a liar. Not exactly the best way to sell a book that masquerades as nonfiction. In the same interview, he had the gall to then claim he'd never had any plastic surgery. <laughs> when we can all see the clear difference between his face of 21 and his face of 42. I think we can all safely conclude that Scooby-Doo is nothing more than a self-confessed liar and that nothing he says or writes can ever be truthful. Your thoughts and comments on this miserable creature's well-deserved downfall, or might I suggest endgame, are most welcome. Well, may I point out we can all safely conclude that Scooby-Doo is nothing more than a self-confessed liar and that nothing he says or writes can ever be truthful. Well, that's not actually accurate, my dear, to be a nitpicker. Some of what he writes is accurate and some of what he has written in the book is accurate, which leads me to believe that he's really a nastier piece of work then you would otherwise have to excuse him for being had it been pure ignorance. I think like Megan, he is a self-hating entity who enjoys being a creature of artifice. You know, no 
body of any substance poses the way they do in endless labels. I mean, you might have nice things that might have cost a lot of money, but you don't announce your good taste, in quotes, which is actually bad taste, with endless labels. I've seen some of his publicity shots. I mean, if he can't drag in a label, he's not happy. And I think he has another book in him. People think this is the end. I don't think this is the end. I think he has another book in him. And I think that this book will make even more money than this one, which I'm not sure this book is going to make that much money because it's so nasty and it's so, so weighted in one particular direction. And it is so identifiably vicious when it doesn't need to be that I really don't think people are going to be that attracted to it. But let's wait and see. But he has another book in him. His memoirs about when I was Megan's agent, when I was Megan's memories of the propagandist in chief by Yosef Amid Goebbels Skadi. Mm. She also has a book in her. I was forced into it all by everyone. I really am innocent. The memoirs of Meghan, other Duchess of Sussex, covering my malignancy, my miscarriage, my immediate malignancy thereafter. How I managed to... Well, let me stop there. I'm saving it for my book. And now I am going to address a bit of this ghastly work. He makes a very interesting point, Scabies, on page six. He's speaking about Queen Elizabeth II and he says, she inhabited her stately role completely. Her personal life was her own and she fiercely guarded it, knowing full well that to share it was to lose it. Is this the man who wrote Funding Freedom and Finding Freebies? Yes, it is. This is the man who wrote Funding Freedom and Finding Freebies with Meghan and Harry's help. But he understands, knowing full well that to share it, in other words, your personal life, is to lose it. But then he inconsistently thinks that Meghan and Harry should not only share their life, but share their disgusting habits, including when she, how she defecated and how he was absolutely so enthralled with it. But, well, oh, Megsy, baby. Oh, chocolate ice cream. Oh, mm. I think I'll marry you. He then, the next paragraph, because he never misses an opportunity to be nasty about every single royal except Meghan and Harry, who of course are perfect. He then said, with Charles and Camilla, it's the opposite. The king has lived a full life out in the public as an outspoken environmental activist, an occasional meddler in politics, a successful businessman, a flawed father, and a philandering husband who destroyed the life of Princess Diana. 
an ignominious legacy he's easy to put behind him now he is on the throne. That is a total lie. Now, he never knew the Princess of Wales. He clearly knows nothing about the marriage. I would refer him to my books if he really wants to know what happened. I'm not saying there wasn't fault on both sides, but by Diana's own account, the marriage was doomed from the word go because they were hopelessly incompatible. And as she said as well, and Petronella Wyatt said it last week, she told her that if she had things to live over, she would have conducted herself in her marriage differently. So by the time Diana died, she was very clear about the fact that she had some blame for the fact that that marriage didn't work. I've been saying this for decades, but anyway. He then, of course, has to be nasty about Camilla, who, according to him, is still not universally accepted. <laughs> well, she is actually universally accepted, whether she is universally revered or not. She is definitely universally accepted. I mean, this man either can't speak English or doesn't understand that words have meanings and the meaning of the word isn't what you want it to be. The meaning of the word is what the meaning of the word is. I won't even cover his bitchy remark about uh, disparaging the joke that the king rather sweetly, in my opinion, made on that phone call with Camilla, which was taped, because I thought it was sweet. It was what any man in love with a ribald sense of humour and an earthy woman would say. He's just gratuitously nasty, you know, he, he's, Charles is a stubborn eccentric who has spent most of his life waiting and planning for his ex ascension. Well, yes, he had to wait and he wasn't plotting, uh, which is presumably the pejorative spin that Scabies is hoping we will pick up from the word planning, but he had to be ready. Obviously, he had to be ready because the Queen could have died 50 years before she did. Just make that point for what it's worth. He, he then says, Despite the fact that he's well liked by world leaders and global power figures, during the life of his mother, he was never fully embraced by power brokers within the system. That is not true. I know that that is not true. Scabies should know, having reported on the royals for years, that the monarch is somebody that people gravitate towards, but they also gravitate towards the heir because they don't know whether the monarch is going to die in three or six months. So the immediate heir is somebody to whom they also gravitate and take seriously. And even if they don't agree with what the Air is saying they still listen to it carefully because they might have to be dealing with that air sooner rather than later. He appears in this section not to be 
understanding that. Yet later on, while criticizing William, he makes the point that, in fact, William is sucking attention away from Charles because he and everybody around him, including the people who are power brokers, understand he's the future. So, do you see the wild inconsistency? I don't know if he's on any substance. Maybe it's all the anesthetic he had when he was having all of that plastic surgery. I won't even go into some of the, the nasty things because, I mean, I'm on looking on page seven and there are countless, really gratuitously nasty, bitchy, queeny, nasty things said. I mean, the man is an evocation of a bitchy queen. And I am not saying that to be anti-gay because there are bitchy women as well, bitchy straight women. But my goodness, this one is such a queen, it's beyond belief. He makes out that Charles failed to truly capture the imagination and interest of those outside the monarchist bubble. But that's not true. The Prince's Trust has been one of the most successful charities in the world. It has helped tens, if not hundreds of thousands of poor inner city disadvantaged youngsters. Where does this man get his information from? Then, after having disparaged Charles, he then says his failure to initiate a substantive dialogue with Prince Harry, despite how clearly his son detailed their fracture, their fracture, sorry, in, I had to turn the page, it's half done in <laughs> half, half a word. Let me start over. He, his failure to initiate a substantive dialogue with Prince Harry, despite how clearly his son detailed their fracture in interviews and public statements, is yet another sign of his inability to effectively address family matters head on or navigate constitutional crises. I mean, which planet is this creep on? Is he seriously suggesting that Charles was supposed to admit that he was a racist and that Harry was right to call him a racist? and that Meghan was right to call him a racist. When Harry is called as having stated to Tom Bradby that no member of the royal family is a racist, that is an invention of the press, and that Meghan never called anybody in the family a racist. But He's recommending, in, from his lofty height of experience, obviously he's been a father many times, maybe injected a whole heap of lies into the equation, but that doesn't make him a father. But he is recommending a course of action. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Would you? your treacherous child and treacherous daughter-in-law have told lies about you, which they subsequently admit were lies. And now the lie is being regurgitated again as if it's the truth. And 
you, the victim of their lies, are supposed to engage seriously, comprehensively, and allow them to dictate the narrative. No, Charles did the absolutely right thing. He limited interaction with Harry. And he was, according to Scabies, cold and aloof and missed an opportunity. He didn't miss an opportunity. The opportunity was never there. I mean, if Scabies and Meghan and Harry weren't such liars, they would understand that when truthful people have been victimized by liars, they pull up the drawbridge. They don't invite the treacherous traitors in to attack them yet again. Scabies is then, I mean, it, it, this he is so s s slur after slur after slur. I mean, the book is a study in slurs and misinterpretations and deliberate daggers where there should be none. To add insult to injury, Charles knows his reign will be a transitional one an intervening sovereignty that must happen before his elder son, William, the Prince of Wales, takes over at a far younger age and, and attempts to breathe new life into a desiccated monarchical system. Well, it's not a desiccated monarchical system. <coughs> Sorry. The monarchy is as popular as it has ever been, well over two-thirds of the people in this country prefer a monarchy. Where does he get this bizarre nonsense from? Then he says, as a long-serving member of the Queen's most trusted staff put it to me before the monarch's death, Charles may be the next king, but William is the tr future. You see, he's just contradicted himself. Remember the point I made a little bit earlier about when the monarch is on the throne, the heir is also uh, paid due attention because the heir is likely to be the next monarch and could be tomorrow, next week, next year or next decade. So he knows it. I mean, the problem with the Scabies and Megans and Harrys of this world is that they're so wildly inconsistent. They think that any straw should be grabbed out of the haystack. And we are supposed to look at it and say, cloth of gold. He then says, the brewing power struggle between the favoured prince and the unpopular king is Shakespearean. A familial tug of war waged both on stage and off that still has the potential to unravel the monarchical tapestry. The man's mad. There is no power struggle between the Prince of Wales and the king. They don't agree with everything, but they divide up things, for instance, their issue in terms of food banks for the poor and homelessness, etc. They, they are very cooperative. They have regular meetings. The two of them with their two wives have regular get togethers over lunch or dinner, usually lunch. Where does he get all of this from? Is it Meghan and Harry? Or is it the fact that they've all 
for their own various practices. They are now suffering from reduced recent uh, reduced sorry uh powers of reasoning according to him scheming and backstabbing began all long ago jealous of harry's popularity with the media and william's preferred status in the firm King Charles has been known to turn a blind eye while aides leak details about his sons to the press. Camilla, also guilty of the same practices, caused further damage to the family during her long-running campaign, blah, blah, blah. He also accuses Camilla of getting in touch with, but this comes later, Piers Morgan. Well, Pierce has said she never got in touch with him to congratulate him for anything. All of this is just lies, 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 lies. Now, I can understand why Meghan and Harry have their bizarre agenda. Mickey, quick, go into the kitchen. Get Mutty Coke. I think I need something to loosen up my throat. I can get why Meghan and Harry, because they are both clearly off their conduct and admissions and their previous practices in terms of or resorting to help via external substances. I can get why they are disconnected from reality. And I understand their thinking. I don't know scabies as a subject well enough, and I don't want to know scabies as a subject well enough. But I would say off the contents of this book, the contents of the previous book, his purposeful and constantly vicious twisting of the facts. He, like Meghan and Harry, has a massive chip on his shoulder. And since he deploys race the way she does, and the way Harry has been taught to do. I would say that the three of them are cynical opportunists, but it will be really interesting to see what happens where this book is concerned, because if it doesn't make him a lot of money, he's gonna be in big trouble. He's repatriated to California, evidently. Is he trying to turn over a new leaf the way Meghan and Harry did? Is he hoping to make himself a shed load of money? Well, let's wait and see, because I think the three of them are on a losing wicket. He might make some good money out of this book. Let's hope he does, because it's going to need to last him for a very long time until he and Meg's baby fall out, at which stage we will be treated to his version of the truth, her version of the truth. And you can depend on it. Both of them will be spinning yarns that will be truly unbelievable. But people will be happy to believe them because... They will be confirming the low opinion everybody has of the three of them. And since this has gone on for longer than I thought it would, I am going to call time on this and I will continue with this critique 
uh, in the next episode, okay? So please keep the questions and comments coming in because I need your guidance as to what to cover. And I will see you next time. Okay, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed this. Take good care. Bye-bye. And if you've truly enjoyed this, will you please like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and Godspeed.